Well, good day traders, Chris Wesson here, Head of Research at Pepperstone. Now, if I'm having a look across the boards today, um, we are seeing very small signs of risk aversion. It's not genuine stress that you'd be seeing, but I think the moves are significant. Of course, people have been concerned about China's growth. People have been concerned that Q1 uh, GDP in China could be you know, getting below 4%. Even some calls that we could see a negative number. The people are looking at Q2, Q3, Q4 and saying that, you know, we're probably likely to see a V-shaped recovery based on the idea of a fairly aggressive stimulus. Or, you know, some people are saying that, no, we're looking more something like a, an L-shaped recovery where growth plateaus at these very low levels and that could be a disaster for consumption and demand going forward. People have been talking about the impact that that slowdown is going to have on the supply chains. People have been talking about the impact it's going to have on, on trade with their key export partners and key trade partners. People like Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, of course, in the, on the tourism side, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and people have been parking money into the US. You know, you've got that kind of ring fence side of things where the US makes about 12% of its GDP through exports and trade. And therefore, you've kind of got that ring fence situation. So the US, through its exceptionalism, better growth, um, better quality of growth, has been um, you know, attracting those dollar inflows. And people have been sort of shying away from assets which are heavily exposed to, to China. But the fact is, is that Apple have come out today and, and, and said that they're probably not, not going to meet their, their Q2 guidance where their revenue numbers are expected to be between sort of 63 to 67 billion. Now we've heard people saying out today and saying that this is this shouldn't really surprise given the unprecedented moves to ring fence the coronavirus uh, and the idea that Foxconn and some of the the, 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 you know, the the people who are part of the supply chain um, you know, haven't been able to ramp up production and the idea that Apple have downgraded based on supply but also very importantly the demand side of things um, you know shouldn't really shock but you know you look at it you look at Apple and you can see their share price at all time highs. You look at the fact that analysts have still got a consensus Q2 uh, estimate of 65 billion, which is mid of that range. And you say there's clearly some downgrades to go. Now, if we have a look across the boards today, we can see NASDAQ futures down about half a percent. So it does suggest that Apple's going to lead the market a bit lower, um, but it's not going to be, you know, sort of three, four percent moves in terms of Apple. Now, we are seeing Cosby, which is very heavily related to that semi side of things, uh, down about 1.1 percent. We're seeing the Nikkei down about 1 percent as well. The ASX is only down 20 basis points, but effectively we are getting buoyed up by some fairly compelling earnings. At least that's the way the market's taken this from BHP. The stock's up a little bit on the session there. But we also look across the Treasury curve and we can see buying all the way across. Small buying, Treasury futures on two years are down two basis points. We've got tens down three basis points. But if you inflation adjust that and look at it on a real basis, you can see that real yields on 10 years are now a negative 11 basis points. That has been quite positive for equities. People have been buying equities because real yields have been falling and that's made effectively the future cash flows of these business far more compelling. It's made the net present value of these businesses higher and effectively when you're using um, whatever the risk-free rate is, probably in the treasury curve, uh, as your hurdle rate, your discounting rate, then of course those cash flows become more compelling. Uh, but the fact is, is that real yields are falling. I think that tells you a pretty clear story. We're also seeing oil prices down about half a percent. In the FX market, I like to have a look at what's going in the Korean one. That The Korean one's down about 70 basis points, or sorry, about half a about half percent at this stage. And we're also seeing a little bit of a move lower in, in Aussie yen. Now in vols, we've got Aussie yen vols up about half a, half a vol in one week and one month. So it's not particularly you know, punchy at this stage, but we are seeing that coming down. And the idea here is that we were also concerned about what was happening in economics, but now we're seeing this resonate in corporate earnings. And if it can happen to Apple, you know, it can happen to apparel stocks, it can happen to computer stocks, and people are now looking at that quite closely. Now, so I think what's really important is what, what can we take out of this that's going to cause a bigger drawdown in financial markets? Now, I think for me, firstly, the Fed, the, the RBA, the, um, the Bank of New Zealand, and some of the other central banks have moved to a more neutral stance. Now we're starting to see evidence that corporate earnings are starting to, to, to take a hit. You know, we're seeing the biggest company in the world downgrade their guidance. That to me is a significant situation. We saw Japan yesterday coming out with very weak GDP numbers, and that was just purely based on what was happening in the consumption tax. Now what happens when we start adding on the mix of the slowdown in China and also what's happening in the supply chains? We are very much interested, therefore, to see the data flow for February. And that's what we need to see now. Let's keep an eye on this. If this comes out weak and the central banks don't respond and become much more nuanced, much more nimble, much more aligned with the market, we are going to see, in my opinion, much higher volatility. There was two things that I thought that were going to cause a decent sell-off in markets. One was a much steeper curve and, and a really high, much uh, the rate of change moving higher in, in real yields. 
that would take something fairly inspirational to occur and that's not going to happen in my opinion. The other one would be that we did see a deterioration from, from uh, economics and central banks did not move nimbly and aggressively to come and support like we've seen in the PBOC in China but we're talking about the Fed, we're talking about the ECB, we're talking about the RBA, we're talking about the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and alike, the Bank of Canada. They need to come to the party. Now what is the data that we really need to focus on? Well this week we get uh, Korean 20-day exports. If they come out weak for February numbers, yeah, the market's going to start to put this very much on their radar. On the same day, we also get European PMIs. This is coming at the back of some of the European data, like industrial production numbers, which have been very weak. The euro has been you know, taken to the town recently, especially against things like the CAD and some of the carry currencies like the Mexican peso. So if we start getting the Korean export numbers weak on a year-on-year -year basis, if we get PMI numbers uh, out of Europe and Germany specifically, are looking at very weak numbers there, the market that on the diffusion index is looking for 44, we will start to say, yeah, what if? What is this all data situation all about? And what's the response going to be from central banks? We are going to see the rates move market very well bid. We're going to see the 10-year US Treasury coming down to that recent pivot of 150, perhaps looking to test that. Bonds are going to continue doing well. Inflation expectations might start rolling over a little bit there as well. But we also need, then need to look at things like, um, for me, the most important one, which is the China, IS, uh, China manufacturing number. Now, that comes out on a Saturday, the 29th. So therefore, there is going to be gapping risk. How are things like Aussie yen, how are equities going to trade into that release when we've already seen signs of weakness in the, in the Korean numbers? Hypothetical, of course. But we're going into that um, looking at the manufacturing numbers. We're also looking on the same day on the 29th, the service numbers coming out of China. Now, that diffusion index last print was at 54. So some, some, some modest gains and, and expansion coming from the service sector. But the service sector is going to take it, be taken to town because of the, uh, the action that we've been seeing from the Chinese authorities to ring fence and, and quarantine seen a lot of what we've been seeing. So that wouldn't be a surprise if we actually saw that going into contraction. And therefore, we look at the, the, the Taishan number, which comes out on the 2nd of March. And what that's going to mean uh, on the smaller manufacturing side of things, on the same day, uh, we get the Taiwan, um, same day, we get the Taiwan manufacturing numbers. What are they going to look like? On the 9th of March, we then get the Taiwan export numbers. A lot of that business obviously going to China. So what's going to be the impact we're going to be seeing there? Going back a step, we're on the 3rd of March, we get the US ISM manufacturing numbers. Now, there have been a lot of signs that that could go show better signs of expansion, but that was before we started really focusing on what was happening the coronavirus. That US ISM manufacturing numbers, you know, we've seen really strong correlations with financial markets on that. The market does look at this very closely if we've seen that being taken a hit, especially when we've been seeing the US being ring-fenced and being used as a ring fence, a way of ring, ring fencing capital, yeah, that could put some real sizable volatility back into markets. And that would mean we'd look for a reaction from the Federal Reserve. Rates market would go bid. We'd see bond markets moving up. We'd see the VIX pushing probably up into sort of 17 to 20% on the back of that as well. We obviously look at what's been happening in things like Singapore exports as they come through on the 4th of March, or some of the Australian data is going to be looking at very closely, not just what's happening in commodity prices. So just to wrap up, um, we are at a situation where equities have done very well. Volatility stayed subdued and we've seen credit spreads fairly tight, especially on high yield. Um, but what happens if now, if the data really catches up and we start seeing that February data coming under pressure and we don't get that central bank response? If central banks don't do what we want them to do and give us that metaphorical hug, do we start wearing higher volatility in financial markets? The names from Apple today has shown us that corporate earnings are going to get affected by this. Do the data go through and then do we get the central bank response? That's what's really important to me right now.